Hello. Well, today we are turning to Descartes, um, and I've given you a small selection of the uh, discourse on method and um, the meditations on first philosophy. And oddly, I'm starting out by reading something to you, uh, which is not Descartes, but rather St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine uh, wrote this, well, he died uh, 1214 years before the publication of Meditations. So, um, this should be an interesting uh, first salvo here. You say, it argues St. Augustine, uh, that in philosophy nothing can be perceived for certain. And uh, to gain widespread acceptance of your assertion, you poke fun at the discussion, uh, dissension and disagreement of philosophers, thinking these provide you with weapons against them. How shall we settle the dispute between Democritus and the earlier philosophers of nature as to whether there are innumerable worlds or only one when we cannot find agreement even between them and their heir, Epicurus? Skipping down. It's, you see, this is the same problematic that um, Descartes, on the ground of certainty, was um, living against the, the, the scholastics. Right? But, he asks, uh, the imaginary interlocutor, he asks, how can you be, uh, how can you know the world exists if uh, the senses are deceptive? Well, your objections will never so prevail over sense experience as to convince us that uh, we see nothing at all. Even you do not dare go so far. Rather, you expend your efforts persuading us that things can be other than they seem. But note that what I call world is this totality, whatever it be, that surrounds us and sustains us. I'm talking about only what appears to my eyes and seems to contain heaven and earth, or at least what looks like heaven and earth. If you insist that what I see is non-existent, I still would not be wrong. For only he errs who rashly accepts appearances as facts. It sound familiar. Skipping down a bit. But, you persist, is this the same world you see if you are asleep? I've already admitted that I call world whatever appears to me as such. If, uh, but if uh, you wish to restrict the name uh, to what appears to men awake and of sound mind, then maintain if you can that it is not the world uh, that sleepers or the insane are asleep or demented. All that I am saying is that this entire mass uh, or framework of bodies in which we exist, be we sane or mad, awake or asleep, is either one or not one. Tell me how this statement can be false, or if I am asleep, I may have uttered nothing nothing at all, or if these words did, uh, did fall from my lips in sleep, as sometimes happens. It may be that I did not say them here, or to this audience, or while sitting so. But the statement itself cannot be false. Skipping down. Show me, then, how sleep or insanity or sense deception make this addition incorrect, or the aforesaid disjunctions false. If I remember it when I awake, I'll admit that I've been bested. For if I believe um, uh, it abundantly clear that what appears false by my reason of sleep or insanity pertains to the bodily senses, if the whole human race were snoring away, however, it would <clears throat> it would still be necessary uh, necessarily true that three times uh, three are nine, and that, uh, excuse me, and that this is uh, the square of a, uh, of a number one can comprehend. There is also a great deal more that can be said for the senses uh, that I find uh, unrefuted by uh, the academics. I, do not, I, I don't believe the senses should be blamed because the deranged suffer delusions or what we see in dreams is not the case. For if the senses report things correctly uh, to such as are sane and awake, what does it matter 
what the mind of the sleeper or the madman may fancy to itself. Jeez. And, of course, I lost my page. I found it here. And then finally, under the section heading, I know for certain I exist. We, one, exist, and two, know that we do, and this existing and knowing is something we, three, love. No fear of falsity uh, disguised as truth troubles us when these, uh, when, uh, where these three items I have mentioned are concerned. For unlike the things outside us, they are not grasped by any of the bo uh, body senses uh, the way we do colors by seeing, sounds by hearing, odors by smelling, flavors by tasting, and uh, what is heard by so uh, and, and soft by touching. By forming mental pictures of such uh, sensible things, we turn them over in our minds, store them in our memories, and keep our desire for them alive. <clears throat> but with no image of things uh, fancied or apparent to deceive me, I know most certainly I exist and uh, know and love. About such truths, I fear no arguments from the academics, uh, or the academy skeptics. What if you're deceived, they protest. If I'm deceived, I exist. For one does not exist, uh, who, who does not exist cannot be deceived. Consequently, I exist if I am deceived. This epio ergo sum. But if it follows that I exist, if I am deceived, how can I be mistaken about existing when I'm certain I exist if I'm deceived, since it would be I who exists as deceived, even if I were deceived. It would certainly not be in the matter of knowing I exist, neither am I in error than in knowing that I know. For just as I know that I am, so too do I know that I know. Again, 1200 and 14 years after St. Augustine's death, Descartes turns to reinvent philosophy and essentially pilfers that passage, which we know from his, his studies at Le Fict, right, that he had heavy training in scholasticism, in medieval philosophy, specifically in Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas and the other medievals. We know that he had training in this respect. So, already we have learned something about our friend Descartes. And I'm, I'm going to build a case here. And it's sort of a weird case, but it's a case that it's it, lingering in the back of my mind every time I turn to teach Descartes. There's not all that much new in the content of Descartes' work. If we just start to sort of catalog the elements of Descartes' position. The mind, or soul, is distinct and in conflict with the body. If we think back to our Plato, we find that the body is the prison of the soul. And in fact, in Plato, it's reason and the rational mind, which is waiting for the release of death in order to come into its own. Right? So the philosopher by Plato's argument in the Phaedo, should actually look forward to death. Again, in Descartes, we find the faculty of reason is intimately connected with language. Right? We find this in uh, Discourse on Method in section 5, where he's discussing uh, hypothetical robots and the distinction between human beings and beasts. Sure, you can teach a parrot to say words, but, in fact, in saying those words, anybody of even moderate intelligence, even, 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 even the stupidest person you know, will be able to actually hold a conversation and tell the difference between a parrot speaking and a human being speaking. Why? Because immediately there is this marriage of reason and language that we call thought, thinking about what you're saying, that occurs with human beings, but does not occur with well-dressed automatons or with beasts. 
right? They're just parroting it back. Right? Interestingly, it's 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 sort of interesting to think of what Descartes would uh, would, would would argue about these attempts to t teach chimpanzees American sign language. Right? And I'm sure it's he would have an argument for how yes, sure they can parrot back responses, they can, you know, express immediate desires, but there is no conceptual, there's no marriage of reason and language. They're not really thinking about what they're saying; they're feeling and saying. Right? The senses are disputed by means of a dream argument. St. Augustine, as we saw, just brought up the idea of what if we are dreaming. Right? It, this calls into question sense experience, right? pretty fundamentally, more than, as one of your supplementary um, figures noted, more than, uh, say, the optical illusions. Right? It's, I'm fond of using the optical illusion in my intro classes that the ancient Athenians would have known. The straight pillars of the Parthenon, right? the Parthenon, Temple to Athena, meant to be as perfect as possible. The mathematical dimensions, the best of our engineering today, would have great difficulty replicating uh, what occurred at the Parthenon. Right? It's they pulled out all of the stops to make this as geometrically and mathematically perfect as possible. The problem was when they crafted these perfectly straight pillars, right. From down in the Agora, when you looked up at the Acropolis, there was an optical illusion. The straight pillars would look wowed in in the middle. They would look bent from a distance. So what the ancient Athenians had to do was construct a counter illusion so that uh, the pillars were wowed out in the middle so that from a distance they would look straight rather than bent in. Right? The ancients were very familiar with optical illusions. What St. Augustine adds here is additional reason to call question to the senses. Right? What if everything we are perceiving, not, not just these sort of anomalous kind of things, right? like the pillars that look bent even though they're perfectly straight, or the stick that is straight that looks bent when it is submerged in water, well, what if everything we perceive is merely a dream? What if I am dreaming and I don't realize that I am dreaming? This calls fundamental question to the senses. Huh? Because that which appears to me and might actually have the cohesiveness of other rational sense experience appearing itself to be non-deceptive, what if it's all an elaborate deception. What if it's all but a dream? Contemporary formulations point out that you cannot actually prove that you are not a brain in a vat. What if some scientist at some point cut open your head, scooped out your brain, put it in a vat, and connected electrodes to it that present to you an entirely cohesive human experience and that entirely cohesive ex human experience is the one that you're experiencing now. It's hard to come up with a compelling argument against it. What's interesting in St. Augustine and what's interesting in Descartes is that they push past this example and ask, okay, even given the possibility of my senses being that faulty, what if, or what can I still know? All right. So already present in Augustine is this argument. Now, the bit that actually pushes further than Augustine and Descartes would have to do with the evil genus. All right. Three times three summing to nine right, is the examples that St. Augustine just gave us. So mathematical reason still seems sound even in a dream, right? Because it does not necessarily refer to a sense impression. It refers to a logical connection, right? It refers to principles and not perceptions, right? So what Descartes does that pushes a little bit beyond Augustine is presents us with the notion 
of an evil genius that calls even our faculty of mathematical reason into doubt. What if there were some malevolent, powerful being that simply made it appear to me that 3 times 3 sum to 9 when in fact they sum to 8 or 10 or 44? Right? Now, since it would be precisely the faculty of reason that we fall back upon in order to verify this claim, we have no means to push past, at least immediately, this malevolent evil genius. Right? So he's fundamentally called all of our modes of garnering knowledge into question with his tactical skepticism, which we find present in Augustine as well. Let's move on with the catalog here. Uh, for Descartes, what are we? We are thinking things, uh, things to, to whom things appear. Right? Now, this is interesting in Descartes, but again, it was present in the opening salvo from Augustine. Remember, he was defining world as that which appears. Perhaps he might be deceived about this or that thing that he perceives in the world. But nonetheless, he can be certain that a world appears. Interestingly, and from Augustine and from Descartes, we get the initial seeds of what is to come to be known as phenomenology. Right? Phenomenologists such as Edmund Husserl point back to Descartes for this insight, and I, I tend to think they should kind of point back even further to St. Augustine for this insight, insofar as they want to claim all consciousness is consciousness of something. What the phenomenologists do is bracket the reality of that which is appearing and interrogate the nature of that which appears, how it appears to us. Right? This is this is the opening salvo of um, existential phenomenology and hermeneutic phenomenology and idealist phenomenology, all of this world as well. Right? So from, um, from Descartes, we find that we are thinking things to whom things appear. Right? And the nature of those things that appear to us is in question by this tactical skepticism. In fact, the entire project presented by Descartes is present in St. Augustine. But we're having trouble finding certainty in philosophy. There is recourse to mathematical examples, right? because it seems like mathematics generates a form of certainty that philosophy does not generate. What Descartes wants to do is push past even that mathematical certainty and come up with a first principle of philosophy, which is sure and certain, clear and distinctly known. But again, let's push on. Right? There is this claim that material things are properly apprehended by the mind and not by the senses. Who does that remind us of? Hmm. It seems that this is the key argument that actually supports Plato's theory of the forms. Right? It's thinking and not by perceiving that we are to come to an understanding of the truth. It's going to be the faculty of the mind, which is more reliable. Now, Descartes illustrates this with his famous piece of wax. Right? A piece of wax. It's not the smell, the taste, the texture, the solidity, um, etc., it's the temperature, or anything else perceptible about the wax that give us an understanding of what the wax is, because when heat is applied to it, it melts. When it solidifies, its taste changes, its smell changes when heat is applied to it, etc., etc. Yet, with the mind, we have an understanding of the wax that corrects the senses. So, in fact, it is the mind and not the senses that leads us to perceive material things in the world. Right? The mind is more reliable than the senses. But again, we find this in Plato and in St. Augustine via Plato. Right? Now, what we find is either two or three arguments for the existence of God in the meditations. 
And these are interesting arguments for the existence of God. I say there are either two or three arguments for the existence of God. There's some dispute about whether or not Descartes meant uh, the, 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 the argument that was in the third meditation to be two distinct arguments or uh, just an expansion of the one argument. The first causal argument has to do with our innate idea of perfection. Oh, wow, where do innate ideas come from? Oh, wow, the forms. The forms, all learning is recollection. We have these ideas of the forms that allow us to judge, right? Interestingly, we have this idea of perfection in Descartes, right? And this idea of perfection is too perfect to be caused by us. Who does this sound like? It sounds like Plato. This idea of perfection is too perfect to be caused by us. And we utilize this idea of perfection to enter into judgment. Right? I know I am not perfect because I err. I'm deceived. I come into errors. I've got faulty judgments, etc., etc., etc. So I have this idea of perfection. I, as an imperfect being, cannot cause this idea of perfection. Therefore, perfection must exist to cause my idea of perfection, and perfection we call God. If we want to map this argument, it's fairly easy. I'm going to give you a brief, it's called a scritum diagram here. Premise one, all right? I've got the idea of perfection that I use for all sorts of stuff, judgment. Plus, premise two, I as an imperfect can being cannot cause this idea of perfection. Inference from there is that the, a perfection must exist in order to cause my idea of perfection. Therefore, or God exists. Mm -hmm. This is the first argument for the existence of God, and interestingly, we find it um, all over medieval philosophy, most notable in the St. Thomas Aquinas that Descartes would have been quite familiar with. Uh, so, what Descartes wants to do is use this idea of perfection, this argument for the existence of God, to redeem mathematical reason. If I have a clear and distinct idea of God, then my clear and distinct self-evident perception of my own existence is a sound one, and then I can start reasoning. Right? Now, what is sometimes called the second causal argument, because like I say, it's not quite clear that it's there's hardly a break for a breath in Descartes' writing of these arguments. He goes straight from uh, the, uh, the, the existence of a perfect being to an argument about his own dependent nature. Right? So I would, I would like to call this is the second causal argument. Right? It's not clear if Descartes considered this to be a, dip, a distinct argument. Right? It goes, I'm a dependent being. Those that which I'm directly dependent upon must either be dependent also or not. Now, we can't have infinite regress of dependent beings. Think of it as an infinite number of zeros still summing to zero. Therefore, there must be an independent being upon which I depend. Therefore, this independent being, God, must exist. All right? So again, if we want to scrim and diagram this, argument. It would go a little something like this. I'll put it in red just for the distinction. One, I'm a dependent being. Plus two, that which I'm uh, directly dependent on must either be dependent also or not. Plus three, we cannot have an infinite regress of dependent beings. An infinite number of zeros still sums to zero. So therefore, there must be an independent being upon which we depend. Premise four, 
premise, or conclusion, therefore God exists as an independent being. Right? And again, both of these arguments you would find in some Asians of medieval philosophy argued by St. Thomas Aquinas. A number of them predate him. Right? To some extent, there is a formulation of um, the, 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 the second causal argument, bizarrely, in Plato's Phaedrus. It's, I think, the worst argument for the immortality of the soul that I've ever heard, but nonetheless, the nucleus, uh, nucleus, I can't pronounce words today, of this argument can, to, in, in, in a sense, be found in Plato's Phaedrus. Take my intro course. Right? So, we have these two arguments, which are, again, not original in Descartes. Right? Now, the third argument for the existence of God is, I'll use yellow for it, it's a little bit shorter, right? uh, what we call the ontological argument. Right? God is a perfect being. Right? God is a perfect being. Even those who want to deny the existence of God deny the existence of a perfect being. Plus two. Perfection entails existence. Therefore, God exists. Uh -huh. Now, again, this seems like a novel way to prove that God exists. There's, there's sort of a funny way that I have of explaining this. The first time I encountered this argument, just to move my point along here, it was from a medieval philosopher by the name of Peter Abelard, who formulated uh, it's it something like this. Picture a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. This being must exist. That was the whole argument. That was the whole argument. And it's one of those moments in philosophy where you get it, nah, darn, it slipped away. Wait, no, I get it again. It slipped away. Here's how it works. Picture two beings a picture, a, a, that, that are equal in every capacity. Right? They are perfect. They have all of the perfections lumped upon them. Perfect being one exists. Perfect being two doesn't exist. If we're picturing a being than which nothing greater can be conceived, perfect being one is greater with existence than perfect being two. Right? Now, the reason Descartes is presenting this, this either second or third argument for the existence of God is because in Meditation 3, by both of these early, earlier formulations, right, uh, both of these causal arguments, right, I, you know, wherein I have an idea of perfection, right, I can't cause this idea of perfection myself, a perfect being must exist, therefore, to cause my notion of perfection, right, and in the second one, I'm a dependent being, everything that I depend upon is either dependent it's, uh, by itself, or also dependent, or not, and we cannot have an infinite regress. Therefore, our dependency necessitates an independent being in order to you know, cancel this infinite regress, therefore God exists. In both of these causal arguments, it, the clear and distinct idea of God that we are generating is one that is, in a sense, caused by us. What Descartes wants, and what he gets from the ontological argument, is a notion of God that rests upon its own self-evident validity. It's clear and distinct, in other words. Right? It doesn't rely on me, it doesn't rely on my experience. As clearly and distinctly as possible, we see that uh, God's a perfect being, Perfection entails existence, therefore God exists. Right? 
if you're a perfect being, you have all of the perfections left upon you. Therefore, since existence is a perfection, a perfect being must necessarily exist. Right? So, we have this additional argument for the existence of God, which, again, comes from Peter Abelard. You see what I'm saying? In the content of Descartes, in the content of his argument that we find in Meditations, we don't find all that much new. There's not all that much novel. I like to compare him to Henry Ford. Henry Ford didn't invent anything. He didn't invent anything. The assembly line was an innovation that he grabbed from a slaughterhouse. The automobile, he didn't even design an automobile. Right? He purchased other people's designs, even the Ford Ellipse that we're so used to. That's not his design, somebody else designed it. The first Ford was built by the Dodge Brothers, etc., etc., etc. But the way that Henry Ford innovated is by taking these other innovations and putting them together in a novel and interesting way that fundamentally changed the way that the auto industry was doing business and fundamentally changed the nature of, for example, urban and rural life. Right? And it, the, the cliche goes, Henry Ford put the world on wheels. Right? Well, to a certain extent, right, it's Descartes' method and not his particular insights, which are novel. I think I've demonstrated that fairly clearly, that Descartes' particular insult, in, insights, right, the content of his philosophy is not particularly novel, uh, insofar as most of it has been said before. But rather, it's Descartes' method. Right? and how it is distinct from the dominant modes of scholasticism that were being taught at the time. Right? So, it, just to draw a distinction between Descartes' method and that of Aristotle's, Aristotle's science was based on a method of, a method of demonstration and syllogism. Right? It proceeds first from principles that are assumed to be certain, and from these first principles it logically deduces other results that are in turn treated as certain. This is how Aristotle's logic works. The criteria, uh, criteria for certainty uh, wasn't very high, and the logical deductions that we find from Aristotle are sometimes quite faulty. Therefore, Aristotelian science embrace, uh, embarrasses itself by making a number of grave errors. The new scientific method that sort of proposed by Descartes, right, is based on a system of hypothesis and experiment. And we see that from the form, not necessarily the content, but the form of Descartes' meditations. And we see it explicitly discussed in his Discourse on Method. Right? Uh, the theories are not taken for certain, but just as probable, and they are rendered increase, increasingly probable the more experimental, thought experiment in this case, evidence, uh, there is to confirm them. Descartes, we should note, is only part of the way into this worldview. Most scientific inquiries follow this model, but he feels uh, it important to claim to have first principles that these scientific res results follow from logically, and he feels it important to argue that these principles are absolutely certain. So, for Descartes, right, the interesting um, bits of his philosophy have to do with this method that he lays out on the basis of four principles, and we started with this in Discourse on Method. The first of these principles, just to paraphrase here, is that we should never accept true that which is not plainly known to be true. That is, avoid hasty judgment. This is where he demands that ideas be clear and distinct, which we see actually operating as his criteria of indubitability. It has to be based on principles that are impossible to doubt. So, that's the first principle at work in Descartes' method, which he goes to great pains to say, oh, this is just what I do, I'm not saying everybody else should do it, of course. 
the implication is that he's able to achieve so much that everybody really should adopt his method, and to some extent did. Okay. Two, divide difficulties into as many parts as possible to better resolve them. So break your problems down into smaller problems. Three, or we should proceed in terms of orderly thought from simplicity building to complexity. Right? That sort of follows from the second. Right? But we should move from the simple to that which is more complex. And then, finally, that we should have complete enumerations and general reviews uh, as to avoid any sort of omission. So it should be complete. All right, so Descartes' method, right, which is one that engages in thought experiments and uh, the generation of probable hypotheses, testing them, testing them, testing them all the way, is what is really, to me, novel within Descartes. And this is uh, what I would argue actually produces uh, the particular form of knowing and knowing subject that modern philosophy gets its start in terms of. Uh, these inferences were already to some extent present within the scholastics. Uh, we had a, distinct be a distinction between mind and body. Aristotle, and this was your discussion form topic, oh, not Aristotle, Descartes wanted to claim that he's not Aristotelian because of this distinction, this, this, this conflict between mind or soul and body. Right? But he's not Plato and claiming that the body is useless, right? that the body is just a machine and the mind is merely a pilot in the machine. He wants to claim, he wants to claim, and he does claim that the mind and body are closely united to one another, yet he doesn't really argue this. He experimented with the natural sciences, with embryology, with um, dissections, with it, it sort of a, a crude sort of it, it, neuroscience in order to try and figure out where the mind and the squishy thing that we call the brain actually wind up connecting with one another. He never fully demonstrates the distinction, the, the, the connection, how closely tied and united the mind and the body are. He thought it had to be in the brain, but there we go, right? So it's Descartes' method which is interesting and took the world by storm and not his particular inferences. A number of ironies, he thought he so clearly demonstrated the existence of the God and, God and the immortality of the soul as to put the question to rest from there on in, right? This was in his preface, the preface to the meditations, uh, when he was sending this document as, as a plea to the Sorbonne for their support. Right? Of course, it, this doctrine, right, this, this, this argument from Descartes was adopted by people who then became atheists right? and who uh, ultimately wanted to break down the distinction between the mind and the body as it's presented as the new, the inventor of the mind-body problem. How do they connect with one another? Well, ultimately, an empiricist wanted to claim that mind and brain are the same bloody thing. Right? So, Descartes' method is interesting. His particular inferences had a few ironic sort of um, uh, consequences to them. Okay, where is my note? Now, what I want to do is think through a series of questions with you. And um, these questions have to do with how human beings are, according to Descartes, distinct from his hypothetical robots and his animals. And what this has to do um, with, with Descartes' account of the basic nature of subjectivity. Right? Now, Descartes argues sort of presciently that we can design a machine to do things better than a human does. Right? It uses the example of clocks that keep a more accurate picture of time than humans are able to conceptualize in their minds. But human beings are generalists. Right? So well, a machine may be able to do one task very, very, very well, 
human beings can do a variety of tasks very well and on the basis of a reason melded with language, figure out, learn, think, and engage with the world in a way that a machine never, by his account, will be able to. Right? Now, it's interesting, our dark science fiction future in the past 70 years or so, longer than that, Asimov, I suppose, um, even longer than that, if you want to plumb the depths of, of the history of science fiction. But nonetheless, the idea of robots, cognizant robots, thinking machines, right? Um, this, this, this calls some question into Descartes' assumptions here, but even, even the best of our science, right? It doesn't really offer us a robot, a machine, that thinks the way a human being does. Scarlett Johansson's um, Siri movie aside. Right? Now, this is the key to distinguishing us from animals as well. It's reason and language, the ability to think about what we're saying. Sure, you can train a machine to speak. You can train a, <clears throat> a, 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 a an animal to some degree to parrot back what you're saying, right? And this is how Descartes would account for chimpanzees as well, right? But there is no real thought going on there at all, right? There's no real thought. They just parrot it back. They just imitate it back, right? And we have this experience when we try to use Siri to do something, right? So we ask Siri to tell us a joke, and Siri's got a list of jokes. Right? We ask Siri, and Siri to, and we can design it to seem personable, but it's quite clear that it is just an operating system that is parroting back formulaic and programmed responses to us. There's no real thought going on there. All right. So, all right. This is sort of the key to understanding Descartes' distinction between robots and animals, and a more genuine human being with the use of reason and language, or what Aristotle called logos. Right? Now, Descartes also argues with regard to subjectivity that we can know our minds much better than we can know our bodies. We've already sort of touched upon this with his treatment of the piece of wax. Right? Our bodies are material. They're sensate, and we know our bodies through the senses, but really it's our minds that give us a genuine working knowledge of the world. So ultimately, we know our minds better than we know our bodies. Right? So Descartes' notion of subjectivity is starting to flesh out a little bit for us here. Right? Now, it gets very interesting when Descartes offers very similar to Augustine, right, who just argued a very, very, very similar thing. But in Book 4 of the Meditations, Descartes claims, right, inheriting this incorrect use of free will is the privation that constitutes the very essence of error. The privation, I say, present in this operation insofar as the operation proceeds from me. But not in the faculty given to me by God. I should pause in the middle of my quotation here to point out that Descartes winds up redeeming the human faculties by couching them in a notion of God as a perfect creator, and the creations of a perfect creator must be perfect in themselves as what they are. My faculties are finite, right? I have intuition, I have free will, I have a faculty of judgment, right? All of these things bring me to a certain knowledge of the world, yet I fall into error. But by Descartes' argument, it is not because any one of these particular faculties are themselves flawed or in any way imperfect. They're finite, but they're not imperfect. It is willful ignorance for Descartes, that is the cause of our errors. It's freedom, it's the will, right, that causes us to be in error. And as 
Augustine was pointing out. Of course, I've lost my page now. Oh, come on, come on. Where are you? Reason, blah blah blah. Down to nature. Let's go to Eugenius. Augustine. Here we go. Existence of God. Apologies. I'll just be a moment. Greatest the soul. Critical skepticism. That's very late on in this. Um, anyhow, he argues that it's 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 when we um, it judge uh, that we fall into error. Do, 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 do. Anyhow, that, that was Augustine's position. I already read it to you. Go back and find it, right? It really, it's when we treat that which is merely appearance as fact. It was early on in one of those first, I think, the second passage that I quoted to you from Augustine uh, that causes us to be in error, which places the error not in our faculty of judgment, but rather in our willful faculty. When I choose to believe that my dreams have some for, sort of bearing on reality, right, or are real, right, that is a defect of the will and not of judgment. So Descartes is building a similar case here. Let's just start over. Inherent in this incorrect use of the free will is privation that constitutes the very essence of error. The privation, I say, present is in, in, in this operation insofar as the operation proceeds from me, but not the faculty given to me by God, or even in its operation insofar as it depends upon him. That's your page 57. Now, interestingly, uh, Descartes lays out several faculties that we have in order to engage from the world. I've already enumerated them for you. Um, now, it's interestingly that it is the will that Descartes points to is the, 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 the cause of error and not any one of these faculties themselves. Right? Now, interestingly, right in this treatment of human knowledge, right? so we've got a notion of subjectivity in which reason and language are, is, are closely tied with one another. We've got a notion of the human being in which uh, the mind is distinct from the body and even to some extent in conflict with the body but closely tied and united. Uh, we have a notion by which we come to know this subjectivity in terms of its mind, which we know better than the meat suit that we're wrapped in. And the meat suit is it, it more a reference to Plato and Augustine rather than a reference to Descartes because we are not merely pilots within a machine, but rather bodies that are tied closely to minds. Right? And then finally, right, we have this notion of the free will which causes us to fall into error. Right? We have faculties that are perfect ones insofar as they exist as finite. Right? But insofar as they exist as finite, it is the will. It's willful ignorance. And he's been building this case all along. Right? People with prejudice, prejudices. In the preface to uh, the Discourse on Method, he was talking about uh, people being more persuaded by wanting to appear to know than, um, than by reasons per se, right? So it's ultimately a willful error when passions run away, right, that we fall into error that causes us to be deceived, right? So built right into this argument is a case for Descartes' method. That's interesting, right? Discourse on method set up a method. The meditations present us with the notion of subjectivity and our arguments for the existence of God, a relationship uh, guaranteed by God to the possibility of certain knowledge of the truth. Right? The idea is that the idea of a perfect yet 
prankish god does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. Right? A perfect god would have all of the perfections laid upon it, and it would be omnibenevolent. Benevolent, rather, not benevolent. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyhow, right? So, as a result of this clear and distinct idea, ontological argument, of a perfect being, this perfect being acts as a guarantor of my faculty of reason by which I can redeem all sense experience if I use my will properly. So there is a moralistic element to Descartes' meditations as well. So that's Descartes, right? And I think the key to understanding Descartes has to be his method. It has to be his method, because the actual content of Descartes, in a sense, there's nothing new under the sun. He wanted to react to and reject scholasticism, but in reinventing and relying on his own meditations, he falls back on his scholastic training um, from Le Fic and elsewhere, and his own private studies as more or less a fop and a dilettante. Right? So, I like to think of Descartes as sort of the Henry Ford character of the history of philosophy anachronistically. That was an anachronism. He didn't so much invent any of the content, but he organized it in a novel way that provides us with a view of subjectivity that, provide, that, that, that places the I that thinks as the starting point for rational philosophical investigations. This lays the, way, uh, the ground nicely for uh, the movement through the rational enlightenment as well, where the statement, uh, the motto, is sapra audi, or dare to know, dare to use your own reason. In other words, be like Descartes, close yourself in a stove, drink rum, have hallucinations, and reason your way through privately rather than accepting the authority of the clergy with regard to first principles, with regard to the nature of subjectivity, with regard to metaphysics, with regard to the underlying nature of reality. Right? So, interestingly, what I find interesting about Descartes is his method methodology and how it plays out politically. Right? His methodology presents us with a, a sort of a proto-ego, which acts as the first principle for philosophy that comes after it. So, I hope you got something from that. Please email me if you have any questions about this material. I went rather quickly and um, in sort of an interesting, interesting way through this material, um, rather than in a very systematic sort of Cartesian way through the Cartesian material. But um, nonetheless, uh, it's, it, it, with regard to our central theme for this course, uh, Know Thyself, what is this self for Descartes? We've, we've sketched it out in rough outline, right? And to what extent can we come to know the, st the self? We've hit several limitations. We've hit several boundaries to the possibility of human knowledge. And the possibility of knowing this self has decisively colored the idea of the self. Because in the preface to meditations, he very briefly addresses an objection to his position in which, okay, this, this thinking thing actually winds up ignoring uh, the sort of feeling and passionate sort of involvement in the world, which you seem not to treat at all. And Baker winds up arguing with regard to everything that's not uh, this uh, thinking act that provides a, a sort of a guarantee for the existence of subjectivity. Right? It, he points out that, well, these feelings, these passions, I, I, I don't know them for certain. Right? I can't have certainty let's restrict it to what I can have certainty about. It's an incomplete investigation, he argues. So, just concluding, right, what Descartes interestingly presents us with is a sort of a dichotomy between subject and object, right? This being a series of faculties that bring us into a relationship with objects in the world. 
the subject, we have a certain reasonable guarantee through the use of the faculty of big R reason to a clear and distinct idea of God. Right? With regard to these objects, it's this clear and distinct idea of God acting through reason, right, which acts as the guarantee for this subjectivity that can bring us to reliable intuitions about the world upon which Descartes wanted to base the experimental and natural sciences. Really, still, it's mathematics that's key, right? because all that Descartes directly, through his argument for the existence of God, redeemed was this faculty of mathematical reason. Right? So, it really, for philosophy, it's really sort of interesting that the subjectivity becomes the center of the investigation, rather than, as in previous sort of investigations, what are universals, what is God, what is the truth, what are Plato's forms, how do we in Aristotle distinguish between form and matter, matter and form for Aristotle were tied, right? These are the things that were interesting. Subjectivity becomes the object of investigation for Descartes, right? And to some extent, after Descartes, we can find this to some extent in figures like Hobbes, and we will find this in figures uh, through the conclusion of this course, notably in Kant and in Hume. All right. So, um, have good days, one for each of you. Um, I hope you found this somewhat useful. Cheers.